Good evening. Good evening and welcome. My name is Madeline Nicholson, and I'm a program officer here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. It is my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening for our panel discussion, Water and Sustainability, the Conversation Continues in Chicago. A quick reminder for our in-person and digital audiences, the Council is an independent and nonpartisan platform. Views expressed by those we host are their own and do not re represent institutional positions or views of the Council. Please silence your phones, but not your voices. This event is on the record. We are live streaming, and we welcome your social media engagement. Tonight's program is part of our Global Food and Agriculture program and celebrates the release of our annual report from Scarcity to Security, Managing Water for a Nutritious Food Future. It first debuted at our Global Food Security Symposium in Washington, D.C. in March, and we are so thrilled to have you here to continue the conversation. By 2050, over half of the world's population could be at risk due to water stress. How will we grow an adequate quantity and quality of food to feed and nourish a rapidly growing, urbanizing world in the face of increasing water insecurity? Here to answer those questions tonight is a distinguished group of water experts. Prasanta Kalita is a professor and presidential fellow in the University of Illinois system. His research includes water, research man water resource management and food security. Sarah Young is an assistant professor of anthropology at Northwestern University. She teaches courses on water insecurity and global health and has worked to develop the Household Water Insecurity Experiences Scale, or HWISE. Our moderator today is Michael Taboris. He is the Global Water Fellow at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. His current research projects address the ethics and politics of water scarcity and the effects of resource depletion on global justice and best policy practices. Our speakers will enlighten us with flash talks followed by a panel discussion. We will be taking questions from the audience as well as through conferences I.O. Please type chi.cnf.io directly into your browser and select today's program. Thank you for being here today. And now a short video on the council's report from scarcity to security, managing water for a nutritious food future. Water, clean, fresh water, essential for life for feeding and nourishing the world's 7.8 billion people. Yet this most precious resource is at risk from overuse, pollution, changes in weather, growing populations, and increased demand. More than one third of the global population, 2.4 billion people already live in water scarce regions. And by 2050, over one half of the world's population could be at risk due to water stress. Crop and livestock production make up over 70% of all freshwater usage. Competition for increasingly scarce water resources is intensifying, challenging the world's ability to increase food production to meet global demand. The majority of the world's farmers are smallholders across 500 million households globally. These farmers are most at risk in the face of increasing water scarcity. Failure to treat water as a strategic, valuable and limited resource will accelerate water insecurity, even for historically water secure populations, with the potential for severe economic, political and humanitarian consequences. Effective water management is a critical global security issue that demands immediate action. The agricultural sector must be at the forefront of efforts to address water scarcity. History shows it's possible through collective will, research, investment, and innovation with U.S. leadership, 
The productivity of agriculture has grown dramatically with fewer and fewer inputs, and much progress has been made to address food insecurity. But for the third year in a row, world hunger has been climbing, returning to levels from a decade ago. To meet the water and food demands of current and future generations, governments in partnership with the private sector and civil society must rise to the challenge of water scarcity. And we must ensure that solutions reach the world's smallholder farmers who play an indispensable role in meeting demand for high value crops. If they can manage water effectively, they can lift themselves and their communities out of poverty. The U.S. must continue its legacy of leading these efforts. Bipartisan leadership and commitment have been integral to sustain progress in agricultural development and resilience. The Chicago Council on Global Affairs 2019 report, From Scarcity to Security, Managing Water for a Nutritious Food Future, recommends strengthening cooperation and communication between the agencies and experts that work on water issues, easing the roadblocks to greater private sector investment in sustainable water development, Leveraging U.S. expertise and influence to improve water resource governance and sustainability. And strengthening support for research at the nexus of water, food, and nutrition. If we work together toward the goal of sustainable water management and agriculture, we can reduce the stresses of water insecurity, diminish the threat of conflict, and achieve a nourishing food system for all. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Sarah Young from Northwestern University. Good evening. It's really such a pleasure to be here tonight. I want to thank the Chicago Council on Global Affairs for the invitation and the Carnegie Corporation, who have recently named me a fellow for this work. So tonight I'm going to answer two questions in the five minutes I have with you for this presentation. And the first is how to measure household water insecurity. And the second is, what does household water insecurity tell us about nutrition? No. Um, there are a lot of terms that are thrown around, scarcity, security. So I want to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing, which is water security. And by that, I mean a, a very comprehensive phenomenon. It's the ability to access, benefit from affordable, adequate, reliable, and safe water for well-being and a healthy life. So it's, it's the whole shebang. To answer those two questions, I need to take a little detour and sort of a mini backstory to tell you that I'm trained as an anthropologist and a nutritionist. I spend most of my time working in East Africa. NIH gave me a big grant to look at the impacts of food insecurity on what we call the first thousand days of life. That's the year before birth and the two years postpartum. And we hypothesized that food insecurity would be really harmful in these four pathways in that period of time. We were measuring food insecurity using a tool that the US government developed, USAID. It's called the Household Food Insecurity Access Scale. And you can easily quantify food insecurity with nine simple questions. And nine times three, that they're scored from zero to three. Nine times three is 27. Anyone in this room could get a score, and we would know your household food insecurity. Um, with my anthropologist hat on, I wanted to make sure we were asking the right questions about food insecurity in addition to quantifying its health impacts. And so we did something called photo elicitation interviews, which is where we gave moms cameras and asked them to take pictures about what shaped how they fed their infants. And I expected pictures of failed crops, but to my great surprise, we got back pictures of water and a lot of pictures of water. So we had this beautiful study design. We were ready to quantify the impacts of food insecurity. We clearly needed to quantify the impacts of water insecurity as well. But existing measures of water insecurity fell short. There are physical measurements. We have lots of ways of measuring water in the physical environment, at the state level, and the quality of water. But we were missing those, something to measure those comprehensive experiences of water insecurity like we could for food. And so it seemed to me that we needed a sister scale, something for the brother that food insecurity is, something like the household water insecurity experiences scale. I'm presenting this work today, but this is the work of many scholars across many countries and many disciplines. And the details can be found online. I won't, I won't bore you with them here. 
Uh, but basically what we did to develop that scale is we pulled together 32 questions that we know from site-specific scales to measure water insecurity and wrapped them with a bunch of ethnographic knowledge. We then administered these surveys in a lot of places with really heterogeneous water problems. So very dry, flooded, with good infrastructure, with little infrastructure. And we pressure tested those 32 items to figure out what it was that really held. What, what were the salient items across, across sites? I'll skip the statistics and the theory and let you know that we have now come to the magic 12 items that quantifies water insecurity in a really comparable way across sites. So the items look like this, and I can, I can tell you more about them during the Q&A. How often have you not had enough water for all of your household needs? How often have you experienced limitations to your water or have not had enough water to wash clothes? And so on. And it turns out those 12 items are looking to be fairly powerful. They are valid, they, so they, they predict the things that we would expect them to predict. They predict stress, they predict food insecurity, and I'll say more about that soon. And they predict time to collect water. Really importantly for making cross-site comparisons, the scores are valid. So a seven in Pakistan means the same as a seven in Kusumu or Kathmandu. And this scale is now ready for broad implementation, and it couldn't have come at a better time. The UN has declared this decade to be the, water, the decade of water action, and they say, they start out by asking for higher resolution data, saying you can't manage what you can't measure. So what will household water security data tell us? It's going to tell us three things. It will tell us about the prevalence of water insecurity in really high resolution ways. We'll know if it's men, women, which parts of the country. And this high resolution data is really exciting to UNESCO. So UNESCO broached me and Gallup World Polls, and we're working together to raise resources to get the HY scale into Gallup World Polls next year. This has been really powerful for measuring food insecurity. Food insecurity is now a sustainable development goal indicator because of Gallup's work. We'll also be able to determine the causes and consequences of water insecurity. So those four pathways that I talked to you about with food insecurity, well, the science is wide open for water insecurity. These pathways are basically unquantified. I will tell you, though, some preliminary data from our study in Kenya shows that water insecurity predicts food insecurity, which is really exciting if we want to shift the dial on food security. Lastly, household water insecurity experience and scale will tell us, it will help us to monitor and evaluate interventions. And already a number of NGOs have taken it up and are implementing it to understand how water insecurity impacts what we drink and what we eat and how we care for our families and how we, how we interact as societies. So with that, I thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, the Global Food and Agriculture Program at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs builds the evidence base for supporting food security and poverty reduction by investing in agricultural development uh, and supporting the more than 500 million smallholder farmers that there are globally. These are people who are farming on, on five acres or less and provide up to 80% of the food for Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And each year, we focus on a different aspect of this uh, problem and dive deep into the best policies uh, for meeting these challenges. And the results of that are the Global Food Security Report, which we're releasing today here in Chicago, the, uh, the US Policy Companion for that report, Food Security Symposium in DC, which we hold in March, and an array of companion publications, and a demonstrated record of influence in both US government and food security policy at the global level. Smallholder agriculture, uh, 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 this year we've, we've focused on the following problem in smallholder agriculture. Uh, after a long, steady period of decline, hunger is again rising. Uh, we produce globally enough calories, probably, to feed the population, uh, but we don't produce enough nutritious food for the population. Uh, and neither calories nor nutrition are distributed evenly across the planet. 
Moreover, nutritious food requires quite a bit more water to produce. Uh, and as a result, uh, water is a, is a significant limitation on nutrition. How can we effectively manage water to produce adequate nutrition for all? Much like the calorie nutrition distribution problem, water availability and undernourishment are not coextensive. Uh, there are some very dry places in the world that have very low rates of food insecurity. And uh, indeed, some of them are the most agriculturally productive parts of the world. And in other places, uh, like sub-Saharan Africa, there are adequate water resources, but high, uh, high rates of malnutrition because agriculture and infrastructure are inadequate. So the important takeaway here is that rather than looking with concern at growing water scarcity or, or only looking at that, we should notice that government, governance, infrastructure, technology, policy, these things can make an enormous difference in turning the tide toward better nutrition, even in cases where water security is a problem. The food system globally is liable to water insecurity, however. There is a significant projected gap between demand and production of important crops. Uh, feeding the 10 billion people expected to live on the planet by 2050 will require a, a productive increase of, of more than 50%. And agricultural water, as a result, is expected to, uh, the demand for that is, is expected to grow by 20%. Rising global wealth, and that's a good thing, uh, also increases the demand for more nutritious food and for more processed food. Urbanization uh, increases this demand also because uh, urban populations use more water per capita. Uh, all of this increases water intensity, uh, the intensity of water consumption, and it'll require uh, more, more uh, development of water resources. So what do we recommend uh, in our report? We recommend some strategies for confronting this at the global level, starting with improving water governance by coordinating water uh, use sectors through government institutions uh, that are transparent, accountable, efficient, and geographically contextualized. These largely do not exist uh, in the world, and where they do exist, they tend to be significantly underpowered. We recommend uh, creating efficiency through rights and policy improvements by effectively regulating and monitoring water users while ensuring that users have clear legal rights and responsibilities. Agricultural use water users need to know that they can rely on water arriving at an affordable price. And legal, legal rights to land and water can help uh, provide this. We recommend improving efficiency through improving crop uh, and livestock productivity per unit of water used, uh, and the main mechanism for that is more research, technology, and education. This includes returning to historical efforts to provide robust research and development for agriculture in the face of a very different and evolving food system. We also need to think about reducing demand through supporting changing diets and diversifying agricultural production to meet new demands. For instance, thinking about uh, how to meet uh, the rising need for animal sourced protein in the world by shifting demand toward alternatives like aquaculture. Uh, it also includes supporting farmers who are producing nutrient dense food that are outside of the, the, the traditional commodity production system. And finally, uh, we can also improve water security by increasing the managed supply of water. And we can do this by reducing pollution and employing new technology. Pollution is a use of water, because if, you, if water is too polluted to use, then energy needs to be applied to it to return it to a usable state, and so it's not immediately available. Uh, on the technology front, higher rates of irrigation are probably necessary to meet food demands, um, but they have to be adopted sustainably and in ways that are accessible to smallholders. Uh, the, the Global Food and Agriculture Program produces bipartisan uh, research and uh, a, a strong uh, nonpartisan uh, uh, empirical base for our work. We're supported by um, two co-chairs, Earthman Cousin and, and, and A.G. Kawamura, in, in this last report. Uh, our lead author uh, was Mark Rosegrant. And we have a long list of task force members, cross-sections cross of the, uh, the industry and stakeholders to, to help advise us on that. As a result, we've produced a, a wide set of very valuable um, new publications, including uh, the Global Food Security Report and, and others, which are some of which are available in the back. And all, always, you can go online and find them at uh, the, the ChicagoCouncil.org Global Ag Development. Um, along with these uh, and our symposium, we, we also have a solid decade of research, commentary, and analysis available on these on these issues. Thanks. Uh, we're going to proceed now to a conversation.
uh, with myself and uh, our, uh, our, uh, our previous speaker, so uh, Sarah Young, uh, and Prasanta Kalita. So if they're here, they should come. Come to me. Let me see. You guys can go down this way. Thank you, guys. So uh, this is this is great. I've got regi massive regional expertise on water and food security issues, and we're going to talk a little bit about about that for a few minutes, and then uh, when we. Um, when we're done with that, we'll open it up to, to audience questions. I'm also going to take questions uh, through our conferences I/O system online, and I'll be able to get those here, and I can I can ask some of those of you after that. So um, the the way I want, you know we've been talking both of us about uh, international water uh, resource issues, but I want to start domestically. So uh, it's in the news the the Midwest has seen an, un, a really unusual uh, season, L um, large amounts of flooding. It's very serious for farmers in the region. Um, does, does the US water uh, system, does the, do US, does the US agricultural system have uh, a water security problem, uh, given, that, given the recent flooding? Uh, should, we, should we think of it that way? Definitely, there are there are a lot of lot of uh, in places in the in the U.S., including here in Chicago, we have water security problems. You know, let's talk about water security from quantity and quality perspective. You know, here in Chicago, I just read something about an average family of four. They they use about five hundred seventy six dollars annually for their water, mm -hmm. and many of the underserved population they can't even pay. And Chicago is surrounded by the Great Lakes, the world's most abandoned surface water sources. Similarly, Cleveland, the average family of four, they pay $1,300 per year. Whereas in Phoenix, when they bring water from 300 miles, they pay only about $399 for the same size of family members. Their increase in the price has only been to about 7%, where in Chicago, 111% raised in the last eight years. So in a lot of people, they can't even pay for their water. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge in the city areas, you know. And in urban areas, law, uh, sorry, in, in rural areas, you know, water quality is a huge problem. You know, the in entire, in the, in the west part of the U.S., we have huge water shortage problem. Groundwater depletion in, you know, in the Great Plains area, in Kansas, you know, Nebraska, Colorado, in all out there area, water table is depleting because of over pumping. The same thing is happening in, in other, many other, international places. So uh, that's, that's where the Midwest, the water quality is a huge issue. Illinois and Iowa contribute to about 30% of the nutrients that are going to Gulf of Mexico. And Gulf of Mexico is the largest water quality problem, eutrophication, fish kill, and you know all the other, other nuisance that's happening. In entire Great Lakes area, a lot of sedimentation is coming, and you know Lake Decatur in the central part of Illinois, huge water quality problems out there. So because of that, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. How can you provide the abandoned water supply from our surface water that we have to the rural communities as well as to the, to the, to the city areas? So It's hard to think about the United States as having a water problem, because at least in the Great Lakes, we're so surrounded by it. But I completely agree that both affordability and quality and then ex excess, we're seeing flooding like we've never seen, are major problems right here in our own backyard. So I, I want to juxtapose that with the, with the international discussion. And I'm hoping that when we get to Q&A, you guys will have more to add to that. Um, so but at the international level, you know, help me think about this. We're going to need a lot more food production to meet uh, the demands of a rising population who has a more complex set of dietary interests. And yet, we consistently hear that water security is a problem. So what's the future for that, right? Because it sort of seems like we're heading towards a sec water security crisis. Um, the more I study water, the more I find it harder to not think that things are, are worrying. I also see ways around this. I mean, one of the what you're talking right about right now is water availability but in fact there is a lot of water and water can be shaped by many factors including climate and including governance 
So what we care more about than water availability is, is water security. So having enough water of the right quantities and the right quality for our lives. And there are ways to control that, and there are ways that we can ensure water security. Does, does water security look the same everywhere? The same thing? I would argue that there are fundamental things that we need water for that would be a basic, uh, that, that would like sort of basic requirements for water, for water security. Swimming pools are not one of them. Mm -hmm. Beautiful lawns are not one of them, but water for production, so farming, or if you have like a, a car wash or a barber shop, water for um, consumption, so cooking and drinking, and water for hygiene, so washing yourselves and toileting. Yeah, you know, in the, in the in, in international arena, as you just showed in the report, 71% of the water goes into food production. And you, you cannot talk about water without the food component, and you can't talk about food without the water component. So I, I really am so happy that the Chicago Council for Global Affairs, for the first time, brought these two components together to discuss about that. And you know, so so thank you for uh, Alicia and all those group that that had uh, initiated this program. So, and you know, uh, it, it's, it's how do we, you know, today we, we have a lot of hungry people, you know, even in the U.S., mm -hmm. you know, um, one in every eight person goes to bed hungry in the U.S., and that number is exactly the same globally, one in eight or, or, mm -hmm. or so out there. So, in that proportion, you know, the, the proportion of hungry people is the same. More than 40 million people in the U.S. goes hungry. Uh, 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 they, they are hungry, and 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 I can expand on that one. So, how are we going to have? We already have exploited all the water resources out there. So, I think you know what you said. Management is the key, and and you know how do we cut down the water? A plenty of water that we put on agriculture of the 71 percent. Many of them we can cut down by the proper management practices. For example, evapotranspiration. A lot of people in the world, in a smallholder farmers that, that we all are, 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 are caring about, you know, have a, a small plots, they put a lot of water with the hose or surface irrigation system out there. Water is lost back into the environment. And you know, they will put water during the time when it's the highest temperature. We do that here in the US. You know, my neighbor. Last night we had a huge rain in Champaign, and this morning their irrigation system is on because they have never seen the water scarcity in the world. So you know, when we don't do it ourselves, how do we expect our people in you know in in, in other other uh, parts of the world they will do that? So and you know the management, you know we have done a recent study on on managing and also in the wake of the climate change, how the temperature is going to rise. And you know, and, and the humidity is going to go down, or the the rainfall may be high. You know, these are various different climate models. Yeah. They talk about it. So how do you manage that? You can do that. You know, the proper management. You know, like cutting down the heat amount of evapotranspiration, irrigating crops during the night. Why the golf courses? They do that. They irrigate during the night. We should be able to do the similar thing. You know, but again, we have to have policies. In, for example, in, 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 in India, the farmers at certain areas, they get unlimited electricity to pump water. Yeah. That has done more damage to the country and, and with our water resources than any good. Rice production, you know, rice, one kilogram of rice needs 4,000 liters of water. And 60% of the world population, they depend on rice. Even in the US, rice consumption is going higher. Mm -hmm. So, you know, why? We need to change some habit. We need to have policies. We need to have different kind of culture and a and, and lot of, lot of, you know, rather than revamping new technology, we have the technology, we have drip irrigation system. You know, Israel has developed that, you know, 100 years ago. So, so we, we need to have some help for the farmers, those who do that, for the, because it's, it's very capital cost intensive. Uh, technology mm -hmm. out there, and and I think some cultural practices we need to change. Sorry, do you want to add anything? Well, to sum it up, I would say irrigation, yes, um, crops, developing crops that are less thirsty. I think pricing of water is a really important consideration, um, and and setting expectations for what 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 we should be eating. Absolutely. So on, at the at the broad level, some help me sort this out. Um, 
you know, the food system's never been more productive mm -hmm. and really never more efficient in the United States. I mean, if you, if you talk to, food, to agricultural producers, the first thing they'll tell you is that they've never been more productive. Mm -hmm. How do we square that with both this, the worries about water security that you, you're mentioning, but also the fact that hunger's rising again? Mm -hmm. Well, production is different from consumption, and what happens when the wheat is sort of plucked from the, the fields and it makes it into the Wonder Bread at home? It, there's a lot that happens, and there's a huge losses at each time point, and I think those losses are one place that we could improve our, our food use and reduce our, our water use. You, you, you know a lot about it. Yeah, well, you know, that, in fact, Sarah, you brought an excellent point about the food loss and food waste. You know, the globally, we lose about 30% of the food that we produce. In the U.S., the, S the USDA estimate shows that 60 million tons of food that we produce is lost every year. Mm -hmm. If we can only, only eliminate one year of the global, that 1.4 billion tons of food, we can feed 37 million people for the rest of their lives. Mm. So that is on, in terms of only the quantity. And, you know, and then lo look at how much fertilizer, how much water, how much land we put into that 30% mm -hmm. of the food that goes waste. Yeah. You know, just from the perspective, you can look at that. You know, about 60 million hectares of land in the U.S. only is kind of wasted if we lose 30% of the food. And 4 million tons of fertilizers that we waste, which is, you know, 150% more than the entire amount of fertilizers that the sub-Saharan Africa they use. Which in the, turn is ending up in our water. <laughs> exactly. And water. You know, how much water we lose in the U.S., you know, as a, on a perspective, if for the entire city of Philadelphia is buried by 164 feet of water, that much water we lose by wasting that 30% of the food out there. Mm -hmm. So, and then plus greenhouse gas emission, you know, about 3.3 gigatons of greenhouse carbon dioxide is, is generated out there. On energy, on that food, you know, about the total US energy use, about 2% of the energy is lost from when we have the 30% food loss and food where, waste. Where do you intervene on this, though? I mean, how do you stop food loss from happening? And presumably, it's different in, in, in our system, where probably a lot of the loss is happening after people purchase food, whereas I imagine in, in less efficient systems, you, you're losing it on the field or on the way to the... Transport, I would say, is yeah. a really big deal. I, I did a lot of field work in Zanzibar, and I just remember talking with farmers about Get these beautiful, luscious mangoes that just couldn't get to market. I mean, the, the infrastructure isn't there and the capital to invest for these smallholder farmers to invest. I mean, yeah. I think you said something like 70% of, of the world's food is produced by smallholder farmers. Absolutely. And these are people who really are living crop to crop, harvest mm -hmm. to harvest. Yeah. So, so in, in the food loss, food waste, you can look at that differently from developed countries versus developing countries. In the developing countries, again, about 30% because of lack of infrastructure. In developed country here in the US or, or in, in Europe, it's because of our strict policies and you know, luxury and then our habit of wasting food out there. So, you know, and, and mm -hmm. so, what I, you, you ask a good question, how can you reduce? We are, you know, in fact, next week, I'm going to Bangladesh. We have a huge project of, you know, post-harvest losses. So just giving farmers some, some you know, low-cost technology, how to dry their crops so that they are not wasted or not the fungus doesn't grow and the farmers can eat it or, you know, they can sell their crop at, at the right price. It's a good thing. And storage, you know, a lot of new technologies are coming up. For example, you know, this, uh, the Grain Pro Bags, it's a Boston-based company, Peaks Bag that the Purdue University has discovered. Those are doing wonderful things in the world. In the U.S., again, and, you know, I think uh, on the consumer level, most of the, the waste happen. I think it's, it's, the, it's the education, education. You know, we need to bring people, and a lot of things are going on, you know, in the New York cities, in, in San Francisco, a lot of organizations are working on it. A couple of my undergraduate students, you know, what they did, last year they developed a small app, and what they do, they have given that app to the Walmart, the grocery store manager, and the, and the grocery store manager, every week when they go through their, their all the food uh, shelves, so when they scan it, it'll automatically show that this food is gonna expire within the next five days. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So it immediately recorded and it goes to the, the food pantries or, or, or shelters mm -hmm. and they come and get those food out there. So in a lot of those kind of initiatives are going on and you know people are, I mean that information isn't widely available until you talk to people out there. So you know, technology, habit, culture, education, everything, it's a complex problem. But I think, I think, I, I think we should be able to solve that problem. Can I pick up on something Prasanta was saying, um, which was congratulating the Chicago Council on integrating these two concepts. Um, the siloing happens and is real. And it's hard, I mean, they're both such complex problems to think about them, mm -hmm. complex plus complex equals extra complex. But in fact, I think we're starting to see some of the synergisms that can be achieved by folding these two goals together. So, for example, the Sustainable Development Goals has food as Sustainable Development Goal number two, food security, and water as Sustainable Development Goal six. And we are often sort of at odds with each other. We've seen this also in, in with USAID, the way that food and water were once siloed, and now they're coming together under the same umbrella, where we start to see how talking with each other and seeing how goals interweave can slowly m improve the world. Yeah, from the agriculture side, so one of the things I notice is, you're right, the, the, the drinking water and wash hygiene community and the agriculture water community don't always talk to one another, and they do seem like they've kind of managed independently. One, just why is that? I mean, it seems so obvious that it's one water system. But then two, are there, are there concrete things that we can or should do? I mean, at the international level, it's, dif it's difficult because we're talking about lots of different groups here. Yeah. But at, at least at the US domestic yeah. um, or foreign policy level, are there things that we could do to bring those two? So together. part of the reason why they're the distinct is because the disciplines are so different. Mm -hmm. I mean, as someone who's trained in nutrition, it's been a whole new world to come to water. Another reason why they're the distinct, I would say, is because we're measuring them often in different ways, which is one of the reasons why I'm so excited about being able to measure household water and security in a really analogous way to the way we measure household food and security. By doing that, we can see exactly how water and security household, at the household level is underpinning household food insecurity. So if we can speak the same language, both through training and through data, I think we can easily get people on the same page. I don't know, how do you see it? Oh, absolutely. I think, I think you hit the nail right on the head. You know, I, I am working in this area for the last 30 years. And you know, I started my career in India, then Bangkok, then, then, then uh, Japan, and then to Iowa, then to Kansas, then to Washington State, and finally, last 20 years in Illinois. You people don't down. talk to each other. <laughs> people don't talk to each other. No. Water and food people, this is kind of my dream, that why don't these people talk to each other, share their knowledge out there? If you're a water expert, you know, people say, you know nothing about food. If you're a food expert, they yeah. think you know nothing about water. But I think now, you know, especially the involvement of the NGOs and you know other philanthropic organizations like mm -hmm. you know Rockefeller Foundation and you know like also your your Chicago Council of Global Affairs, mm -hmm. a lot of people are talking about that. And in the young generation, you know, and I'm so hopeful about you know people don't give them enough credit credit that they deserve. They are more environmentally concerned. They're more socially and for they they love people. You know they. Somewhere, as I, opposed to old people, who don't well, love people. no, we do, but you know, we come from. We, uh, I don't want to get there, but you know, I just read in a, in a, in a, in a scientific uh, paper that this generation, you know, the millennial generation, they will pay for 157 percent extra for an item if they see that that is environmentally and mm. and socially beneficial to people out there. Well, I don't. Let's I go see. for the cheapest thing. <laughs> so you know. I don't believe you. <laughs> I think another way of bringing the, the conversations together is through shared outcomes. So if we all agree that what we care about is disability adjusted life years lost or stunting or, or food insecurity as an outcome, and when we understand that energy insecurity and water insecurity underpin food insecurity, I think that's another way of, of bringing many powerful groups together. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to, to audience questions pretty soon. Uh, but before I do that, uh, I want to uh, talk about what you guys are up to, because uh, there's some big stuff happening. And I want you to just take a minute, each of you, to, to, to sort of lay out what you think the future is for your work in food insecurity and water insecurity and agricultural development. 
Okay, yeah, well, still. you know, like I said, next week I'm going to Bangladesh, and then I come back, and then I will, uh, I'll be going to South Africa. There are a lot to learn how Cape Town is managing their drought problem, you know, by regulating their water out there. And, you know, I learned so much how the Israelis are, you know, they are, they are using 60 to 70 percent of their water from the saline water out there, and now they're finding that, you know, saline water that they use for drinking it lacks the, some of the minerals that are, that are needed for child development and things like that. But I have full confidence they are going to do that. So you know, a lot of that thing, here is I'm also involved in a locally. And some of you probably know the University of Illinois uh, system. We have three campuses, Urbana-Champaign, Chicago, and Springfield campus. Uh, we have started a brand new program, will be based in Chicago, called Discovery Partners Institute. You know what it is, you know, they, uh, for the first time, we, are, we have four major themes that will be addressed by this institute called DPI, or Discovery Partner Institute. Number one is, is food and agriculture, because you know, being in the Midwest, if, you know, one of our argument, if, if California, if San Francisco can be the major hub for software, why not Chicago be the major hub for food industries and food and things like that? If we don't, California is going to take that away from us, or New York is going to do that for us. So we are going to do that, the food and egg, water and environment, health and society, computer and big data. So those are the four major things that this uh, DPI will be, will be looking at. They will bring in a local, national, and international partners into both research and entrepreneurial systems. Uh, so uh, we, will, we, will, we, will, we will look at or we will address the need for the people of Illinois because it's the Illinois governor, the former, and the current one. They committed about half a billion dollars for the capital that we are going to build right in not too far from here. The, the, the land that is available as several thousand uh, square foot area for research, giving, you know, bringing students, faculty, entrepreneurs, users, and everybody together so they can look at from different perspectives. The research said, Sarah, you know, we need to bring people together. So I am involved in the leading the water and environment, and with my limited knowledge on food and egg, I can also, you know, can help that. So this is what I am looking for in next five to ten years. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> awesome. I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my jam for this next year is to get everyone measuring household water and security. I'm so excited that we have this scale that works across so many settings. And I think it's the best way to draw attention to water. I mean, as I said, I'm trained in nutrition and egg. I didn't think about water. I mean, I'm thinking about food, but of course, it's implicit and in, in water is implicit in so much of what we do, our health and well-being. I mean, we're seeing that water is predicting things as, as crazy as maternal depression and stress, which is even further removed from food insecurity. But in fact, it's all very integral. And it's very stressful to not have water. So my hope is for the metric of household water insecurity is to get on the, the international stage for really understanding where we're falling short, how, what's driving problems with water insecurity, and most importantly, do our fixes fix it? Yeah, that's great. Sarah, before, before you take over, you know, unknowingly you have been working in the food security because nutrition, or nutritious food is a big component of food security. Uh, water security. And right. water yes. security. Right. Absolutely. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, so please, please uh, add questions and vote on them. I'll um, I'll uh, take take some of these off of here, and then we'll also uh, turn to the audience. I'll take one off of here, and then I'll, I'll uh, ask you guys. So so get ready. Um, so uh, we talked briefly about climate change. It was sort of mentioned in passing. What's the expected impact of global climate change on water security for smallholders, particularly? Well, I can speak to what I'm running a study right now in Tanzania, where we're seeing real, really big um, shifts in patterns of waterfall. Not just that water is, there's less rainfall. This is all rain-fed agriculture. Mm -hmm. There's less, but it's not falling when it's expecting, when it's expected. So sure. you can take an already risky um, endeavor, farming, and add increasing uncertainty to it. It's, it's not working well. Well, the, the climate change is, is not for the larger or younger or smaller group, for everybody. You know, one of the things that, that we have found, the, when the temperature is rising, the crop will mature early. 
And if the crop, even you know, in our, we, we did a, a big computer simulation study about that. Every, every crop will mature early, and if the crop matures early, the yield is going to get reduced. On the other hand, we are thinking of increasing our yield 60% to feed another 2.7 billion people. So how do we do that? And you know, the smallholder farmers, they are responsible for like 70% of the world food, so they will be severely impacted. Yes. So we are, you know, we all need to work together. How, how do we come up with new crops? And people are working with, with nanotechnology. You know, I, I'm working with a couple of the young researcher from in, in India. They are developing some nano gels. You know, it'll come in one packet and can serve in several hectare area they put there, and those gels will release water only when it needs. Mm. You know, probably the cost will be very high, and they will need a lot of support from, you know, in the large case implementation. But hopefully, you know, and a little bit of many of these things, you know, changing the time, using, you know, water harvesting structure. Many of the local small communities, True. The water, uh, even if the rain comes, the rain goes away as a runoff. It creates water quality problem. But you know, we have done a huge project in, in Jordan and Lebanon and, and few other Middle Eastern countries with our project is called Water and Livelihood Initiative. We did small scale water harvesting structures for the, for the Bedouin, for the community out yeah. there. So you know, and now you go there after five, six years, they are, they are surviving. That community has been sustained out there by you know, these are not rocket science, but just some common sense that makes sense kind of technology. Yeah. Great. I want to turn to the audience. Um, there's a question over here. Wait for a microphone, please. Oh, sorry. Um, thanks. Hi. Um, I was wondering, even in terms of the Midwest and in different parts of the world where so much excess water is falling and running, is there thoughts being... Um, ideas being bandied about of how to change infrastructure to collect excess water in a way we haven't before because of so much excess rain. I mean, I know that California is trying to think of this because they have to change the way they think about, because water's coming so much faster, so much briefer, and all at once, yeah. rather yeah. than glacier melting and this kind of stuff. Is what's, what's being thought of about that? So is the concept of green infrastructure familiar to this crowd? It wasn't to me until about two years ago. Um, so green infrastructure is a way of building to kind of a accommodate large amounts of water that can fall very quickly, and there's lots of terms for them. But there's a, a, there's a big shift in, in urban settings, both here in Chicago and, and further abroad, to build to adapt to this kind of torrential downpours that anyone who's lived in Chicago has been experiencing. And you can, it, it's really necessary around here. I mean, um, we used to build infrastructure to contain water and to get it away as fast as possible. That was the old, that was the old model. If you think about a, a, like a pipe, if you take a pitcher of water and you pour the water into the pipe, it'll go into the pipe. If you take the pitcher of water and you dump it on top of the pipe, what happens to the water? That's great. Right? It just goes everywhere. It doesn't go into the pipe. Yeah. So the idea behind this is to is to keep water in place as long as possible, um, to keep it from going away, actually. And Chicago has about 60% impervious surface. Uh, we get flooding at much lower rates of impervious surface than that. So busting that up, for example, is, is yeah. important. We just got a big NSF grant at Northwestern to look at some of the ways that food, energy, and water can are interacting in, in positive and negative ways, mm -hmm. and green infrastructure is part of that. And I didn't even know what green infrastructure was till a couple of years ago, but we just redid our backyard to accommodate <laughs> this flooding. We need a whole hell of a lot of green yeah. infrastructure to accommodate the waters that have hit the farmers in the Midwest this season. Yeah, well, the farm, the farm infrastructure is different because farmers are entirely green infrastructure, right? So when it, when it floods like it has been, um, you know, that's, there's not a lot that, that can prevent that. Um, Especially or, when the ground is frozen like it was. Yeah, I mean, that was just that a too, disaster right? upon disaster. Um, and and the, the flooding in the Midwest has produced, I think, probably the largest um, nutrient runoff event that we, can, that we have seen uh, because a lot of the fertilizer that was put on the field just got pushed right in the Mississippi River and it will end up in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. So other, other questions in the crowd here? Right here, ma'am, the yellow jacket. Wait for a microphone, please.
Hi, um, this question's for Dr. Sarah. So I've actually heard you speak a couple years ago, so it's great to see oh. the progress of the, um, the household indicators. So we work on water and sanitation interventions in the developing world, sp specifically, actually, especially in Uganda. And the question I have is, like, as important as measurement is, it's really expensive to put those resources in place. So we're like kind of in this as small grassroots organizations are in this tough situation where you're, you know, you're, if you take money and put it into measurement, it goes away from the actual like water access, the wells, and like providing yeah. water to people. So several questions that I can hopefully ask later, but for now, is your scale out there for public use, and is there support for the data that could be collected from it? So the scale is absolutely public. Um, I have no intention to make any money from this. And it's, it's pretty agile. It takes only three minutes to administer, which is why the Gallup World Polls and UNESCO are so happy to be getting, hopefully, representative national data on this. Um, I can think of resources to help implement this, insights, especially if health data are being collected. Um, and I hate for professors in ivory towers to be saying, go measure, go measure, let us know. I think it's really important to know if your thing is working. So if it's a thingamajig that an engineer comes up with or a new infrastructure, if you can then assess it and say, and it makes this difference in people's lives and depression is going down this way or women's ability to take care of their children is improved, that often can in turn generate funds to support additional additional things, but let's talk. So from, from uh, the online questions, um, is there, is there a so single solution or policy that you think could be implemented that would cause a really significant impact? And the question suggests the following. Vegetarianism, desalination plants, taxes on pollution. Mm -hmm. Is there anything being proposed at the UN or the US uh, government levels that would fit into that list? Well, as far as I know, there is no one thing can solve these whole complex problems out there. So, I mean, what you just mentioned, all of that, and all of that need to be intensified. You know, to me, you know, as, as a college professor, I still emphasize education is our number one priority because people just don't know about it, you know. People, you know, living, they think we have plenty of water, we have plenty of, I started teaching a new class called Water in the Global Environment, and when I asked my very first class, how much water a person needs in the US every day? And someone said, oh, uh, oh, maybe about five gallon. I said, Do you, have you taken shower today or yesterday out there? <laughs> People have no idea. And when you tell that, you know, the US, they, on an average, in you know, 150 gallons of water, and compared to Rwanda, you know, one gallon of water out there. So, so automatically, you know, bringing that information to people is, is very important. Plus, also educating our all sectors of society, the users, then you know, those who use it, the, poli the policy makers, you know, they, uh, you know, they start making policy but not knowing about the, the basics of the issues out there, right? So I think, I think that's where I would start, you know, educating the policy makers about all these complexities of food, water, energy, environmental pollution, and things like that, plus all the other technologies, and you know how, and then government subsidy, that has to be a subsidy. Uh, that lady asked a beautiful question about, and there is an example. You know, we have developed a new bioreactors for for when the fertilizers and pesticides that run off from our Middle East farmers' lands for say Illinois or Iowa or Indiana. So before the the runoff gets into the the, the rivers, so we want to keep all the nitrogen. So what we do, especially, you know, we need to, you need to denitrify, and it's a very easy science, you know, you need to put more food source, and we do that by providing, you know, some of the wood, and, you know, and let the water pass through that in a big wood box, and so the microorganism, they will chew it, and they will release the nitrogen, and nitrogen being in the lighter, you know, it goes to the atmosphere, and the relatively cleaner oxygen. So now what we're working on, the NRCS or USDA should be able to provide some kind of an assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think it's a new farm bill and all are going to have some of those kind of things. Great. Uh, questions from the audience? Way in the back there. Yes. Yes, if I mean you. Just wait a second. You need a microphone. So. 
who you are. Hi, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm curious, given everything that we've discussed, um, food insecurity, water insecurity, um, increasingly high levels of climate um, change, could you all talk to me um, about projections that you see in the next 50 to 100 years? I'm not intending this to sound glib, but it does sound kind of, if you read a lot of the paper uh, papers, you see this kind of stuff. It's kind of doomsday kind of stuff that's that's coming up. Um, and we're just seeing with the wildfires, which we're seeing just with climate change in the world. So I'm curious for after I'm gone, what what it's going to look like globally, and how how I guess what do you think communities are going to be doing? Communities, governments, countries are going to be doing to address this? Um, yeah, if you could just talk about that. Do you want to say that, Mike? Well, I, I think. Um, you know, it's a different, it'll be a different world in a lot of ways, and um, there's, no, there's no avoiding that. Uh, water will get increasingly uh, scarce, um, and, but, but, you know, at the same time, the food system will have to adapt. The places right now that are, um, that, ha that have some of the highest food insecurity risks are, um, urbanizing and advancing pretty rapidly. It's possible uh, that they can do this in a sustainable way. I, I'd love to hear Prasanna talk a little bit about this because you've got a, you know, lots of experience in India watching them uh, kind of meet their food security goals with irrigation. Um, you know, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, you'll see large increases in population. Uh, very, very rapidly in an urbanizing population. It'd be, very interesting to see whether they can do that in a sustainable fashion. Yeah, well, you know, that, that is a million dollar, maybe a billion Brilliant. dollar question what you ask <laughs> about that. And, you know, in fact, one of, one of my PhD students just completed about, you know, by the end of this century, what would it look like? What would the weather look like? What would the food production system, what would the water look like? And, you know, based on the past data, so we do the, the you know, the climate change models. Uh, we, we embed them our, our crop growth model. So let's say we, we just look at the, the crop growth. So what is gonna happen, carbon dioxide concentration is gonna go high, as we all know. But that increase in carbon dioxide concentration is gonna help increasing the crop production. But do we have the other essential ingredients for crop production? Solar radiation is gonna go down, although the temperature is gonna go high. So when the solar radiation go down and the temperature, because a lot of will be diffused because of the pollution and things like that, that's going to reduce your crop production down there. So because of the temperature, as I mentioned before, the, the, the duration of the, the crop growth period will be shortened. So yield will go down. A lot of people who is, is moving from rural to urban areas. So that is another big problem out there. And there is a lot of push about growing food in the urban areas. We all, because there are some limited amount of infrastructure, we are going to start a new program from University of Illinois in Chicago called MetroFest, Metropolitan Food and Environmental System. You know, how can we grow food in an environmentally sustainable manner out there? We don't know the outcome of that, but all we can hope that you know, we will make people's life better. You know, we'll have to have the climate adaptable scenarios that we just now simulate by the models and things like that. But again, you know, the mother nature will come and destroy everything, all our the results that we, we do by the computer simulation model. <laughs> so so you never know, but you know, as long as we have good, you know, uh, good science. good technology, good policy, good people and goodwill, I think you know, we have to think positive. We have to make the people excited about the future. Yeah. One final, very quick question, and, and then we'll, we'll end. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Thank you. Just a quick question on um, when it comes to technologies that can address this, for you know, whether it be improved irrigation or is there for either of you is there a technology that comes to mind that's been scalable for uh, smallholder farmers uh, and and. And if so, I think a bigger example that comes to mind often is Jane Irrigation in, in India. But I think they also, sub, the government maybe subsidized 50% of the cost. So is there something that, is, that can be scalable to improve water access for small farmers? Uh, does it require a subsidy? You know, anything that you would like to bring it to the smallholder farmers, first of all, 
If you don't give subsidy, if those technologies are the, we call it best management practices, you know, series of practices, they, they have to be affordable by the farmers. You mentioned chain irrigation. You know, right now, I know, you know, many farmers, they are using uh, the drip irrigation, uh, trickle irrigation. I have also seen, even in the rice field, where it needs the maximum water, people are developing those technologies about, you know, so if, if that becomes a very you know, scalable and successful and cost effective, look at that. You know, we will cut down the water use for many of the East Asian, South Asian countries that they use for rice production. So again, you know, that irrigation technology, water conservation, I have a, I'm working in a project in people in Cambodia, you know, the conservation agriculture, you know, like, Having you know, uh, you, you, you cut down after at the end of the, the when you harvest, leave the residue on the ground so it preserves all the moisture. These are low hanging fruits. Some of the things that before what we used to do, even in the US, after you harvest, you put a fire, you burn all the residue and all out there, which does a lot of climatic damages as well as damage to the soil. So, you know, a series of practices that you can do, and, and they are, they have been proven that they are scalable, but the cost is the main thing. Yeah. And Sarah, one final word. Well, this can be a doomsday conversation, and it can feel a little apocalyptic, but if you look back 100 years ago, we thought the world would end and no one would have enough food and there would be too many people. Yeah. And as it happens, there are people who don't have enough food, but we have developed a lot of technology and we've been creative and we've been kind and worked together. So I would argue that if we can have a good perspective on, on how much, what the extent of these problems are, and then talk to each other with policymakers, science, and, and innovation, there's certainly hope. Yeah, there you have it, uh, optimism and human ingenuity. Uh, thanks very much for your attention. Um, Please continue the conversation online uh, at the Chicago Council and elsewhere. And thanks for your attention. And let's thank the thank speakers.